tonight, Everest the Experience continues as Disney's Imagineers bring an ancient legend and modern thrill ride to life. And Survivor Man Les Stroud shows new ways to conquer the mountain. Everest the Experience continues right now. Every 60 seconds, 34 passengers embark on the thrill of a lifetime. And then all of a sudden you're phew. A one-of-a-kind theme ride brings them face-to-face -face with a boogeyman, the abominable snowman, known in the Himalayas simply as Yeti. Okay, so that's the big move right there. State-of-the-art technology meets ancient legend in this brand-new Walt Disney World theme attraction. You have your enable. Expedition Everest. And for the first time, Disney's allowed Discovery's cameras to film the secrets behind the scenes. Ready, here we go. From making the biggest, baddest animatronics creature ever. There is nothing that is this big that moves this fast. To constructing a monstrous, man-made mountain that's Florida's highest peak. To engineering a coaster that's full of surprises. This is the story of how it was done. In Orlando, Florida, engineers work round the clock to build a thrill-a-second adventure attraction like nothing else on the planet. Expedition Everest is a high-tech wonder that brings an ancient legend to life at Walt Disney World. Expedition Everest is clearly the big, exciting, fast, powerful power ride of Animal Kingdom. To make opening day, Construction workers pour almost 20 million pounds of concrete, bolt on 5,000 tons of structural steel, and bend 38 miles of rebar. They're working as fast as they can. A year ago, this area was basically a dirt field with a slab, the beginning of the mountain. Now, 500 craftsmen, artisans, and engineers a day swarm this handmade mountain range. But soon, it will belong to the Yeti, and he wants everybody off or else. We wanted to tell the story about the Yeti, the Asian version of the abominable snowman. And where does the Yeti live? The Yeti lives in a mountain. The Yeti lives in the lower Himalayas. So we wanted to create a very immersive, a very real environment where guests might expect to really see a Yeti if it exists. For Disney's Imagineers, that means scaling an Everest of art and engineering. The air is thin where no one's gone before. There's certainly been creative challenges and construction challenges on the project. This may be the most complex attraction ever built. It starts with a 20-story mountain that towers over the park. Then there's a roller coaster with a twist that throws all other thrill rides for a loop. You're actually spiraling up back into the mountain, and typically on roller coasters, you spiral down. There's a Tibetan village that looks like it's hundreds of years old, but it's actually brand new. You make the call. I believe that is browner than it needs to be. It could be lighter. And then there's even a top secret lab where they're creating a monster, the Yeti. This beast is huge and more powerful than a jet engine. So the animators are keeping their wild man under wraps as they perfect every detail. If that's dirt around the toenails, then I think that's, uh, that's what's called for. <laughs> They've got to nail down every inch of this giant. Why? Despite the technological wizardry, Disney wants guests to experience a good story. We Imagineers consider ourselves to be authors, like writers of stories. We just happen to write these stories with physical objects and, and action. That's Walt Disney Imagineering's Joe Rohde. Joe's the visionary behind Expedition Everest and Animal Kingdom. Can you tell by the earring? This guy thinks outside the box. Sort of imagine bringing fins of rock strata that interrupted that horizontal weir. Joe really carries the creative vision. He's responsible for what our guests see at the end of the day. He's coming off of this giant mountain. All these glaciers are melting. You know, you gotta believe that this is a massive, ma okay, that's better. Now, that's looking good. For Joe and the Imagineers, every attraction has a storyline. Once it's written, no changes are allowed. Sure, that creates some challenges, but that's their story, and they're sticking to it. Our story is that this village has been the here. The story is always supported Complete by story. The story. So enforce the story, because we'll be the same. On the story, to tell the story on this ride. Bottom line, story's important. 
Getting the details right is so important. The Imagineers go to the source, the real Mount Everest. I have always believed in taking the Imagineers to real places and giving them real experiences. A Tibetan town like this is where inspiration met imagination for the Imagineers. The storyline for Expedition Everest is based on their meticulous research here. On Expedition Everest, we, the guests, come to this Tibetan village that surrounds us because we want to get to Everest, which we can see right through the pass. There's these entrepreneurs in town, Norbu and Bob, they're ready to comply. However, Everest is reached through the Forbidden Mountains and all the local Tibetan people, they're freaked out and they don't want us to go. And they're worried about the Yeti who they think is really real and they think he's gonna get us. Every scene in Expedition Everest will be like a movie where the guests are the stars. Fun idea. Are the Imagineers up to the challenge? The man in charge of building Expedition Everest is Mike Lentz, and he does know a thing or two about making mountains. Everest is Disney's 18th. But even Mike found making Expedition Everest had a steeper learning curve than expected. When we got into the design and we saw just how much steel there was to integrate and coordinate, we certainly found out that it was more challenging than we initially thought. The fact is, Expedition Everest is just really big. When the design team started work, they let their imaginations run wild, but maybe too wild. Their first design was so big, they had to scale it back. And there were other problems, too. We've got a huge mountain, and I, we, can't, we can't make anything this big. It's just not, not right. But on top of that, for all of the size, we're not convincing anybody that it's a real mountain because we keep seeing the train come out like 20 different times, and that's going to blow the scale. The team also wants to move from clay modeling to digital. That'll make it faster and easier to try new things. But it takes 24 clay versions to come up with the final design, which they then scan into the computer. What happened next would have been impossible without today's digital pre-visualization tools and the high-tech wizards who wield them. We created a computer model that combines all of the different uh, aspects of the attraction into one so that we can see how they all interact. We can move around in this space and we can see how those systems interact to see if there's any problems in the design. The technology really helped us to be able to, to do this design quickly and without a whole lot of changes. Typically, a project like Everest takes about three or four years to design. With the digital tools that we have right now, it enabled us to complete the design in 18 months. The digital design tools not only let them do it faster, but also more efficiently. When a coaster goes really fast, it's chewing up a lot of land really fast. And unlike a place that would just throw up coaster track and let you see it, we're not doing that. This all has to be beautiful. It all has to look like the Himalayas. And it has to leave riders as breathless as climbers summiting the real Mount Everest. This three-minute throw ride looks like it'll do just that. The train will rise 100 feet on one of the world's fastest coaster lifts, then plunge down 80 feet at 50 miles per hour, only to spiral up again at a hair-raising 60-degree angle. Now, the question was whether the delicate balance between the mountain structure and coaster track would translate from the virtual world to the real one. The challenge was keeping the vibrating track close to the rigid framework of the mountain, but not so close that they would ever touch. Bring it closer to this guy over there? I think so. I think we can get close to that without... The two cannot touch, but they want to share, in some cases, the same space within space. And we try to maintain a separation of about six inches everywhere throughout the ride system. The best place to see how close the two systems come is right in the guts of the mountain the internal support structure, where only a few engineers are allowed. It looks like Tinker Toys on steroids, but it's actually one of Disney's most sophisticated designs. There's roughly 5,000 tons of structural steel in the ride and mountain structural systems. The black steel is the vibrating track structure. It's dynamic. It moves as the trains move through the mountain. It's designed to do that because the load of the train as it moves through the hills, the drops, the curves, the turns, it's gonna move. The red and white steel columns and beams form the static structure of the mountain. It's rigid, and it must be rigid because the rock work, the skeleton or the surface, the skin of the mountain, is all carved plaster and rock work. It needs to be supported with a rigid static structure. As the project the moves from work. design to construction, the team needs to access the entire surface of the 200-foot mountain in order to build it. But traditional scaffolding won't work. It would block their view 
The engineer's unique solution up next. In the shadows of Mount Everest, a train awaits. But be warned, those attempting to reach the summit must face him. Expedition Everest, a chilling new ride, only at Disney's Animal Kingdom Park. And now, here's an Everest Insight with Survivor Man Les Stroud. When Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay summited Everest in 1953, they might have had an ice axe just like this one. Laser goggles, crampons just like these. Modern equipment hasn't changed much, just gotten lighter and stronger. Pretty important factor on a grueling climb 29,000 feet above sea level. An aluminum ice axe like this weighs only a quarter of this baby. And every ounce counts. At the extreme altitudes of Everest, a heavy pack might start off at 50 pounds. But on the final push for the summit, it's down to 15 pounds, carrying probably only an oxygen canister and an energy bar. All right, and a camera too. Aside from a sleeping bag and a tent, some of the equipment that's gonna help you summit any peak, including Everest, some rope, climbing harness, stove, fuel, pot for cooking. And as well, you've got your more technical climbing gear. Carabiners with pulleys, nice screws. Of course, just as vital as your equipment is your clothing. Every climber dresses in layers, a wicking layer close to the skin so the moisture wicks away from your body. And then the layers get thicker as you move on out, each one trapping in a bit of air, another level of insulation. If you wore just one big thick layer, you're gonna sweat too much. You take it off and you freeze. And there's the key point. You start sweating and the wind can just wick away all of that heat right away from your body, chilling you down quickly. And hypothermia is not far beyond that. So there's Everest Gear 101. Pack light, pack warm, and dress in layers. Stay tuned for more from Les Stroud as building a thrill ride Expedition Everest continues. For months, a team of engineers and artists has been recreating a Himalayan mountain range in Orlando, Florida. It's all part of a huge new attraction that includes a roller coaster screaming through a forest haunted by a Yeti. We should be able to come back in, kind of, again, crisp up these edges a little bit. Artisans have to access every square inch of the mountain to put on the rockwork face. To get the look and perspective right, they have to see the mountain from a distance. But traditional scaffolding would be too cumbersome and block their view. Trying to do both has the design team caught between a rock and a hard place. And it's a mass of scaffolding, and it's, and it's all on the outside, and we're gonna, we can't see through it to see the mountain, to see what we're doing. We can't use traditional scaffolding. They come up with a solution. Instead of doing conventional scaffolding out here, what I think I might be able to do is, from the structure, come out with members that just come out and provide a, a working surface, it's going to look like toothpicks coming out of the mountain. They'll need more than 2,000 of these giant steel toothpicks to support the scaffolding. This right here is a typical tab arm. It's a channel that goes back and is supported by our structural steel. And we had it extend out five feet so that we could put planking on it and create self-supporting scaffolding. Once the construction workers are done with a section of the mountain, what do they do with the tab arms? We can then cut off the tabs one by one. Chris, go ahead on over there and cut them off. Cutting them all off took almost three months. And an engineer looking at this mountain three years from now is going to go, how was this possible? Because the clues will be gone. The tabs also solve another problem how to attach a rock-like surface to the steel framework of the mountain. What we decided to do was a new method that we ended up calling the chip method. They made more than 3,000 rectangular rebar grids called chips, each as unique as a puzzle piece with its own specific place on the 3D puzzle of the mountain's rock face. 
And the chip method is taking that chip and hanging it on tab arms. The same tab arms used for the scaffolding. To make the chips, designers used the computerized model they made earlier in the design process. Now they divide it into modules or chips approximately six foot square. Those modules are then bent into the rebar profiles that you see uh, here. Each bar is a 3 8 inch diameter bar, and they're unique to this position on the mountain. It takes almost 32,000 bags of cement to make the outer crust that covers the rebar chips. We need to make sure we get at least a couple big drifts of snow within this little rock formation that we've got. A mountain range now rises into the Florida sunlight, but it just doesn't look like the Grand Himalayas yet. The Imagineers need to fool Mother Nature and Expedition Everest guests into thinking this is real. Maybe the designers were unwrapping their sandwiches for lunch when they came up with the answer. Aluminum foil. And it's in effect a, a flexible form. We're able to do the basic shapes by trawling the cement. And then while the cement is still wet, we can press this and emboss this foil into the surface and actually sculpt it. Then later that foil will be removed and, the, and our sculptors will go back over the entire process with a series of brushes and tool marks to finish it up. What we're looking for are very crisp, sharp rocks. This is the Forbidden Mountain Range. So everything is sharp, it's spooky, very scary type of geology. In the story, the Forbidden Mountains are very high and very far away. One of the things that we were trying to do is, is create the perspective of the Himalayan range. And some of the low peaks are 20,000 feet. Mount Everest itself is 29,000 feet. How do you get that much distance on just a few acres of land? Using a trick of the trade called forced perspective. That's a process where we try to make an object look bigger than it actually is. Where we have a foreground, negative space, a midground, negative space, and then a background. Forced perspective is common on a smaller scale in set design and painting. But this may be the world's largest set, so this is tricky. The mountains have to look realistic for both near and far. Guests may even snap a closer look with telephoto lenses. When the guests are very close to the rock work, the rock has to appear to be one-to-one, -one, and as the guests are further from it, then it has to be increasingly further and further away. In order to accomplish the illusion of the mountain looking 30,000 feet high, we have to reduce the scale. Uh, when I'm instructing or directing the crew, I often use examples like, well, picture a Greyhound bus if it was that big. If one way to create the illusion of distance is with scale, the other is with paint, and lots of it. 2,000 gallons, dozens of colors, 20 painters, and an artist's sleight of hand. Because if we paint every portion of the mountain highly realistically, um, it's not going to read properly. So we've really got to make adjustments in color and value. Even the snow is not all the same color white. We have four different grays that we paint for snow. Even with the bugs worked out of the mountain, there's still a lot to do before opening day. The story calls for building a Tibetan village that looks like it's centuries old and a roller coaster that looks like a steam train. Climbing the real Everest might be easier than this. Now, here's another Everest Insight with Survivor Man Les Stroud. If you're going to climb Mount Everest, you're going to need a ladder. Seriously. Climbers approaching from the south side will need to cross the Kumba Ice Field, a dangerous maze of nasty crevasses. A crevasse is a massive crack in the ice, formed when a glacier moves or the ground beneath it falls away. They can get pretty deep and wide and represent one of the most potentially dangerous parts of any climb. Every year, the Sherpas and guides lay ladders across the crevasses to act like bridges and secure them in using ice screws and snow stakes. Last year, the ice fall had 12 crossings requiring ladders. In one case, they strung together five ladders over a crevasse 20 meters deep. Actually, crossing on the ladders isn't all that tough. It just takes some good balance. Climbers wear rigid boots like these and crampons. You can practice and train for it in your own backyard.
The real challenge here is psychological. If you do get vertigo, you're in for a tough time. Many mountaineers claim that this is the most daunting part of climbing Everest. And if I were over a true Everest crevasse right now, I know I'd agree. It's just mind over matter. There. Now, using your ladder to clean the leaves out of the gutter, looks pretty tame. Stay tuned for more from Les Stroud as building a thrill ride Expedition Everest continues. The design team creating Expedition Everest is working rain or shine. Bring it down. Can they finish the attraction in time for opening day? So many groundbreaking designs could do in the construction schedule. Just a little bit. The focus now is at the base of the mountain, where workers construct a Himalayan village. For the millions of guests who will visit Expedition Everest, the adventure begins here. In this village, things are definitely not what they seem, but everything is true to the story. And we want to work into these buildings a certain amount of distortion. None of these buildings in the real world are vertical, plumb, straight buildings like we're used to here. They're completely settled, twisted, over many, many years of existence. Architects need to capture the look of an ancient village while meeting modern building codes. The story of this building is, of course, that it's a stone building. But what we really wanted to try and do is make it look as if it was starting to subside. So the right-hand side of the building is sinking down. So what we've done is we've created an arc in the eave above. We started to set the windows so that they are all no longer in a horizontal line, but starting to sag down. So on this building, we've got the uh, rammed earth construction. All of the architecture of the Tibetan Himalayas is symbolic. Every color has meaning. Some people think the black around the windows is to actually heat the wall up so that that hot air um, is drawn into the building and keeps it warm. The reason we're using red on the corners is there's a cultural significance to the red, and it's kind of a protective color. And what it is is that you want to protect the corners, protect around the openings of doorways. What's inside the buildings is just as important to the story as what's outside. We acquired over 8,000 props, so that should give an idea of almost a museum-like quality of your experience. The props team went on a second-hand shopping spree in Tibet. They bought everyday items from everyday people. We're buying their scissors, their animal troughs, their egg baskets, things that, that wouldn't occur to anybody to ever sell. So we'll go out and we'll meet people, talk with them, become friendly and ask them if they're willing to part with some of their things and we'll buy them new things instead. Yeah, these big old fat, these are like handmade nails. Um, they're all hand forged and we bought his whole supply, which probably was a year's worth of nails. So I'm wow. sure he took a nice vacation after uh, we did business with him. We tend to go into a lot of these places and buy out the entire store. Okay. 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 Then, yeah. It's yeah. kind of like if you walked into Sears and said, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Even new artwork has to look old, so it feels like it's been here for centuries. We had to, through many sort of strange physical means, make these pieces look old. That can make the artist a little testy, especially when they've created something really special. I try my best to um, let the artisans finish it completely and then have a separate crew of artisans age it. <laughs> Here's the AIDS masterpiece after it's been glued back together. What we found works very well. It's kind of funny out here and everybody makes fun of us for it, but it's a technique using peat moss. We throw it on all the, the buildings, on the statues, on the wood, and it's kind of the final touch of aging. The peat moss creates random blotches, an artistic version of age spots. People often ask, you know, why do we put in this detail when people aren't necessarily going to see the detail? Well, we really feel that our guests can absorb a lot of that detail, and it really adds to the richness. Because everything is so realistic, when it rains, when you're in a storm, it just, it just feels more real. So I think it kind of looks great in the rain. Meanwhile, ride designers work on the coaster. The biggest challenge here is staying true to the story. 
We wanted to tell the story of an Asian village at the base of the Forbidden Mountains where trekkers are going to take a steam train through the Forbidden Mountain Pass. This little steam train's going to pull up and let off steam and you hop on board and away you're going to go for your very convenient and merry trip through the pass to Everest. But there's a problem. How to make a roller coaster look like a steam train and sound like a steam train, but thrill riders like a roller coaster. It starts with the car design. It's an aluminum structure with fiberglass panels bolted to it. That was the most efficient structure. The car is light, and every ounce counts in constructing this coaster ride. It all comes down to what's called a weight budget. You have a weight for the fiberglass, a weight for the seats, a weight for the guest restraints, a weight for the wheels, all these things, and you come up with a final budget. The challenge through the design process was getting each one of these subsystems to come in on budget. But it's got to look like a train, too, an old train. It's up to the artist to turn back time. It's got soot all over the cab, and that we're going to have tons of rust on all this steel. It's supposed to be a cast iron, and then it's heavily, heavily rusted. But there's another difference between a coaster car and a steam engine. Steam. We have a steam effect, so when the train comes in, you get the feeling that it really is letting the steam go, getting ready to go out again. It takes some smoke and mirrors to transform a coaster car into a steam engine. Over here at the uh, beginning of the load area, we have our steam effect. And the steam has a boiler, which is right outside the building. The trick is getting the steam from outside the building, inside the train, and out the smokestack. That boiler will feed these pipes down here, go through some regulators, some filters, comes out, and we have two special nozzles we have these fan nozzles on either side of the train. Underneath the train, the steam uh, goes off, and it goes under the train, it comes up the smokestack, and um, we're ready to board. In the story, the train is on its way, heading into the Forbidden Mountains. When you crest up into the mountains, you zoom around to this broken track, you come to a dead halt, and the tracks tore to shreds in front of you, giant footprints in the snow. At this point, the ride becomes, oops, we have to get away from the Yeti. And so now our journey becomes get back home, get away from the destruction wrought by the Yeti, and return back to the village. Here's the dilemma. The train has to suddenly come to a stop, reverse, and go backwards in six seconds, something never before done in the world of roller coasters. There's a good reason why not. It's really hard to do. Engineers finally find the solution, ironically enough, from the world of railroading track switches, but these are no ordinary switches. We're standing right here at Brake Zone 2. Um, this is track switch 2. There's two identical switches. These track switches pose the most challenging design issue that we had on this project. These track switches weigh 200,000 pounds apiece. We had to fly them in with a special crane, and the creative requirement to meet with the storyline was that they operate in six seconds. Here's how the track switches work once the train stops. Start your stopwatch, please. The computer gives a signal that unlocks the locking devices. The track switch rotates, and the locking devices relock. Six seconds, and then the train moves on. With the train cars, tracks, and track switches in place, the team is ready for a critical test, which would take the train around the mountain for the first time. Tower, can I have an enable? Coming up, the moment of truth. The coaster's fully loaded with people-sized containers of water and ready to roll. Later, meet the star of Expedition Everest, the ever-elusive Yeti. Now, here's another Everest Insight with Survivor Man Les Stroud. You know, we've all seen those Hollywood films where the action hero goes sliding down a mountainside out of control and in the very last second, plunges his ice axe in and does a one-arm rescue. <laughs> Looks good for film, but it ain't real. In fact, what it is is a good way to pull the arm right out of its socket. What I'm going to show you is the proper method of self-arrest, one you can use on any climb, including one as big as Everest. When the slope gets this steep and the weather closes in like this, you've got to be prepared for the worst, and that includes going for a tumble. The proper way to hold on to an ice axe is tight to your body, keep the bottom end at leverage, and keep the sharp, spiky end away from your face. When you can, flip over to your stomach and jam it in. Kind of like this.
Well, that's not quite as sexy as Hollywood. But then again, reality never is. This has been an Everest Insight. We now return to building a thrill ride, Expedition Everest. Pressure's on as the Imagineers begin the crucial test of their Expedition Everest design. They're about to run the coaster fully loaded around the track for the first time. They slowly move the train out of the maintenance building on a movable track table. The heavier the train is, the faster it goes on the track. So we want to put some weight in here. We're putting uh, 170 pounds per seat. These water dummies are uh, acting as our guests for our, our first drop test. <laughs> the purpose of the drop test is test to make sure that we've done our energy calculations correct on this design. We're just real excited. This is our, this is our first test. Let her go. The first test. First time it's ever been around the mountain. We're excited. There's one more thing the designers need to finish by opening day, and there'd be no attraction without it. The Yeti. The Yeti is the Himalayan version of the abominable snowman, Bigfoot. Some claim to have seen it, but no one can prove it exists, or even what exactly it may be. But we do know that it's embedded in Tibetan culture. There are many, 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 many different ways that you see the Yeti. And you see the Yeti in the more elevated art that is associated with the Tibetan culture and the monastery and the fortress. And then you see the Yeti as a real living animal. We position the Yeti as justifiably angry. He is sabotaging the railroad. He's driving us out of the mountain. His message is you don't have a right to everything you might want to claim, right? And that's a good message in conservation. If you come here to Expedition Everest, you want to see the legend of the Yeti brought to life. Bringing an imaginary creature to life is the ultimate science project. The design team calls in an expert, a biologist. A brainstorming session may be the best way to make a monster that's part science, part science fiction. We have two approaches to how we deal with organisms that we've never actually seen, but we want to try and image for the public in three dimensions. We're starting with primates, things we know well, and we're taking component parts that we think are the most logical pieces for this character in this environment, in this story. The secret to breathing life into the Yeti was invented by Walt Disney himself. To accomplish this, we created a new type of animation. So new that we had to invent a new name for it. Uh, uh, ooh, uh, 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 audio animatronics? Right, audio animatronics. It was a way for Disney to bring his animated characters from feature films into theme parks. This is where Disney created the most advanced animatronics creature ever, Expedition Everest's Yeti. Only a handful of Imagineers are allowed in this secret California laboratory. Disney invited Discovery's cameras in on one condition, that the Yeti's face be obscured by this plastic. They're trying to prevent a case of Yeti identity theft. But it seems like this creature could protect himself. He's 25 feet tall, four tons, about the size of a bull elephant, and very lifelike. Throughout the figure, there are 19 separate functions that uh, provide the motion that you see on the figure. The arm forward, the wrist, the elbow. When I first ran it, you know, I stood in front of it, and, you know, he just came right in front of my face, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, really amazing. This is going to scare people. This Yeti is the single biggest dynamic figure that has ever been built. There is nothing that is this big that moves this fast in the world of animation. It's, it's really pretty cool. This thing truly is a beast. 
so large and it's so dynamic that it couldn't be built like a traditional animated figure where his mass and movements were supported off of his legs. So what the engineers did is we designed a horizontal slide and a vertical slide in this long boom. And the boom actually goes into the Yeti's back. So he is suspended from that boom, goes in and out five feet, up and down 18 inches. The Yeti's powered by a 3,000 PSI hydraulic thruster that can be recharged in 20 seconds to fit the storyline. If you took all of the cylinders, the linear actuators on this, the thrust they produce is greater than a 747 airliner. There's no question this monster's a marvel of engineering. That's just one big machine. So we're really reluctant, generally, to peel back the illusion and show you how it works. But in this case, the Yeti is such a tour de force of engineering itself, engineering apart from the illusion, that it's worth talking about the amazing work that's been done just by the engineers on this project alone. If you took his arm off and looked at it and looked at his forearm truss section, you would think you were looking at a NASCAR or a F1 car without its body. Making the Yeti's motions real and scary is the job of the animator. Animating in traditional animation or film animation is you're just trying to get your shot right for the scene. With audio animatronics animation, we have to make sure it looks good from every angle because guests will be going through a three-dimensional space. The animators produce position data. It tells each of the 19 functions what position they each need to be in for any particular scene of the show. This console here that was developed uh, back in the 1960s helps us to be more artistic with the figure so we can go through it like a puppeteer would go through but we also with our graphical editor have the ability to go through it frame by frame just like you would in film animation with CG or traditional animation. As an animator, uh, we have to, we always feel like we have to get into character, you know, just like a method actor would. So I started by going to the zoo with my sketchbook, and I just watch the way they move, and I get a feel for, you know, their motion. Yeah. Dreadlocks. Dreadlocks. <laughs> a range of sizes, okay. a range of thicknesses. The finishing designer also looks to the animals for details like hair and nails, and then creates them in the lab. The nails are molded part of the fiberglass body and they're painted to look like dingy animal nails. <laughs> then there's the skin-tight fur that fastens on like a bodysuit. There are about a thousand snaps fasteners on this beast. There are about 250 zippers, and there's about a thousand square feet of fur fabric. Um, the spandex layer goes underneath the fur, and it protects the fur from the mechanics on the inside. All dressed up and ready to go, the Yeti makes a very scary picture. When you're on the ride and you see the Yeti for the first time, you won't know what you're going to see. It's going to be this big moving mass. There's going to be hair and teeth and claws, and you won't really know what you're looking at. You'll have to go back several times. When I did see the Yeti move as a finished creature, it was fantastic. There's four and a half days. So cool. Just that looks great. I mean, it's Thanks. just coming down. Time to pack up the Yeti for the move from the lab in California to the lair in Florida and make sure he's positioned to maximize the fear factor. Now that the Yeti has arrived in Orlando from LA, the Imagineers work nonstop to settle the animatronic monster into its new digs. We've come a long way. Uh, virtually everything in the exterior is complete now. The buildings have all their surfaces on them. We're beginning to install the special effects in the mountain that create the mist, that create the sounds. We'll start testing lighting. The trick is making every illusion as real as a movie come to life. One of the challenges is when we found out from the creative team that they wanted a look of mountain snow blowing off the peak. We realized that we were going to be competing with Mother Nature, and that's always a huge challenge. Mike's job is to change water into mist. The water comes out at this high pressure, this velocity. It hits a very small pin right in the direct point of it, and it atomizes the water. It just changes the entire look of the water. Voila, mist. As important as it is to get the visual effects right, it's just as important to fine tune the audio. There's this distant cry of the Yeti 
that you hear when you're paused up at the broken tracks in the mountain. What does the cry of an imaginary creature sound like? Gotta use your imagination. <coughs> Better leave this to the professionals. Professional sound designers, that is. We hear the echo of the train whistle, but it might be as late as... The cry of the, the Yeti is only one of the sounds of the mountain. The other thing is this whole echo, this, this whole notion that the mountain's really big, really big. The secret of the sound is hidden in the mountain. It's on. In this attraction, we've got about 200 speakers placed throughout. A lot of them in rock work, some of them hidden under the track. With the ambience mixed in with the Doppler as we come around the corner. Like, we can always adjust them independently. OK. Yeah, let's take the next one. We can always check it from the overlook okay. as well. Yeah, essentially, we have the world's biggest audio tour. After three years of preparation, it's finally time for the train to leave the station for real. I think our digital model predicted very accurately how the vehicle would move and what the show timing would be. What the model can't predict is the physical sensation of what it's like to be in that vehicle. It looks really exciting. I'm excited about the opportunity to actually finally sit in it and ride it. Finally, it's time to open the ride to the first excited guests. Attention Expedition Everest team members. There's no question that for an Imagineer, the ultimate thrill is watching a guest experience what you've been working on for years. Seeing people's faces light up when they are surprised by what you know is coming. I'm so excited, I can't wait. It's a thrill a minute for coaster lovers. Every twist and turn is terrifying and new as the story comes to life. The mysteriousness of you don't know where you're going or what's going to happen next. Yeah, it started off slow and then it took off. The ride going up with the rails just kind of split off and stopped. I was like, what are we going to do now? Oh, no! Oh! My favorite part was going backwards. I never would have expected it. And the drop hits you in the middle of the ride, and you're not expecting it then. And all of a sudden, it's just like, whoa, there you go. And the Yeti, that hand going down, I'm, I'm right there. <laughs> I love roller coasters, and that was probably the first one that ever actually scared me. It was awesome. I loved it. I've never experienced a ride like that. Totally awesome. Honestly, like, I don't think I knew what was happening the entire time. It was, it was wicked, wicked cool. cool. <laughs> For every Imagineer, especially Joe Rohde, the writer's excitement echoes their love of the Everest story. It seems the attraction's as irresistible as the real thing. I hope that people can experience the feeling of adventure that we had when we went to the Himalayas. How could you not love it? It's a fantastic, fantastic environment, an incredible ride, and this incredible Yeti. I think it's pretty cool.